Good morning, church. How's everybody doing today? It's a great day to be here. Tell you what, man, I'm excited uh, that we just get to continue to worship the Lord and come together in this way. And uh, it's September 1st. Whoa! What's going on around here? In 21 days, it officially is fall and my birthday. So we get two great things out of the 22nd of September. That is a loaded statement. Make your remarks in your notes now. The 22nd, pastor's birthday and fall. Two wonderful, amazing things that happen. But I can't believe it. Today's the first of, of September. We're in a new month. And uh, we're posturing ourselves to enter into the last part of this year. We're not there yet. Tell somebody we're not there yet. But it's coming quick. Tell them it's coming quick. And I believe, though, that as we get ready to go into the last part of this year, it's going to be the best part of the year. Come on. Does anybody believe that? Has anybody got faith for that? It's going to be the best part of the year. The Lord gave us a word for this year, as many of you know. And, and, and if you're here for the first time at Abundant Life, man, I'm so glad that you would just spend a Sunday to be with us, to worship God, be in the presence of the Lord. And, and it's an honor to, to have uh, you with us today. And um, what a special time. But we, we, uh, every year we give a word. God gives us actually a word and it's from, obviously, the Bible. We're not just up here making up words. Um, but the Lord gives us a word every year. And this year, our word for Abundant Life Church is, comes out of Psalm 92. And the scripture simply says, those who are planted in the house of the Lord will flourish in the courts of our God. And it's almost a, a twofold uh, you know, statement that's made there. If you're going to flourish, you got to be planted. And so this year has really been on a lot about getting planted. In fact, God really spoke and ministered in the capacity of, of understanding that we're going to progress this year. Uh, that there's going to be seasons of maturity and there's going to be uh, seasons of strengthening. There's going to be seasons that there might be challenges and difficulties, but if you're planted in the house of the Lord, know this, that God gives you every single thing to withstand every trial, every giant, every circumstance, every situation, because God is for you. That's just an encouragement right now. I said, God is for you. I said, God is for you. God is with you. God loves you. And so no matter what walk of life you're in, no matter what you're up against, whether the season is, you know, rainbows and butterflies, or you're like, man, it's about as, you know, wet as the rain outside, uh, know this, your best days are the ones that are ahead because God's word said, if you're planted, you'll flourish. I love that. I love that. I love that. That scripture comes with a promise. And so this year I declare that promise that we are called to flourish in every area of our life. Not in some, not in a few, but every area you are called to flourish in Christ Jesus. Amen? And so uh, we're going into this last part of the year. It excites me. It thrills me um, that we get to, to go into this season. I, let me tell you, I've had some wonderful testimonies that's come to my attention over the last uh, couple of weeks. You know, we've been in this teaching series, Open Windows, and um, how many of you have been with us throughout the, the series? Just wave at me, yeah. Hasn't it been awesome? I'll tell you what, what we've been learning in the Word of God and what God's been showing us um, through uh, uh, this series, Open Windows, which again, it comes out of the book of Malachi, chapter 3. We've been putting our attention, our focus on what the Word of God says regarding tithe and offering. And um, I'll get into, obviously, the next part of it today, but... but some wonderful testimonies have been coming up as we've been in this, in this uh, series. I had one individual that came to me and said that they were having a hard time uh, with uh, uh, paying their rent. And they've been going through this series and they've been participating in the principle and the practice of bringing tithe. And long story short, the Lord opened up the window, moved in a capacity where they were able to have what they needed to pay the rent for the month. 
And they said, Pastor, I, I, as the scripture said, I tested the Lord. The Lord said, try me, test me in this. It's the only place in the Bible he says, test me. So they did, and look what happened. God moved in that area. I had another individual that came to me and said, I don't know how I'm going to be able to pay uh, for college. You know, it costs X amount of dollars, and where I'm at right now, I can't afford it. But I've been operating under these principles and these practices, believing in the promises of what we've been talking about through open windows. You're not going to believe what happened. At this point, yes, I am going to believe what happened because I know what my God says in his word. He said, somebody gave me the money because I had my need for this area, and, but, but I was willing to be obedient to the principles, and I got what I needed to pay for school. Come on, praise God for that. The Bible says that God's not going to be mocked in this, that whatever you sow is what you shall reap. He says, try me, test me, that I would not move in such a capacity that people can't deny that it's me. And I'm here to tell you today that God is with you, he's for you. And let me tell you that, that all of the promises, it, it's not necessarily going to always have to do financially, but maybe there might be a relationship that needs to be restored. Maybe there might be something in your life that, that you're believing God to move in a given area, favor on the job, maybe favor in the house. I don't know, but all I can tell you is this. God says, when you honor me and you worship and you, and you, and you set your affection is where we're going to pick up today again. When you set your affection before me, watch what I'm going to do in your life. I said, what? God says, watch what I'm going to do in your life. The Bible says this, that God takes pleasure in the prosperity of his children. God is happy with your success, which means you should know, or at least by now, based upon as we've been in the, this, this series, you should know that God has created you, called you, ordained you to walk in success and victory in every area of your life. Somebody say amen. And so... The Word of God talks very favorably about the fact that God wants us to prosper. He wants us to be in good health. He wants us to walk blessed. He wants us to increase. He wants us to be able to, 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 to see Him dwell among us in every area of our life. And all of that is simply for this, so that we can be a witness letting the world know the goodness of God. And I said this, it's not about what God can get to you, but what he can get through you so you can be a blessing to others. It's what God wants to get through you so that you can be a blessing. God doesn't want to just meet the need, but overflow. Somebody say overflow. That sounds like a good word, overflow. God wants to overflow in your life. Psalm 23, he says, my cup runneth over. Well, what does that mean? It means he wants your cup to overflow. He wants your cup to overflow. I talked about this this past Wednesday night. Um, we were teaching about, the, about Ephesians 3.20 that God can, God is able. I'll just say that for the room. God is able. He's never not been able. He, he's never gotten tired or exhausted or worn out on the job. God is always able. He's a constant. God is eternal. And he says this, I'm able to do exceedingly and abundantly above all we could ask or think. Above all means not according to my capacity, according to his capacity. He'll do exceedingly above all, above all, above all. So whatever your limit is, God says, I'm going to take it one more higher. That's God. That's how awesome God is because God loves you. Amen? All right. So I want to get into our thought for today. Uh, last week we um, started teaching and talking about the principle of offering, the principle of offering. And um, as we got into the word last week, uh, there was a, a handful of truths that, we've been, that we begin to discover. Uh, and, and, and again, I don't have time, you know, to go through all of the stuff that we talked about, but I got a few things, if we can just do a slight overview. Is that okay? We're going to do an overview. So class, talk back to me this morning. <laughs> All right, we're going to do a little teaching. But this is, but this is important. Um, again, our, our series is coming from Malachi chapter 3. Uh, and again, you don't have to turn there right now. Um, but Malachi chapter 3, he simply says, I'm the Lord God, I do not change. He goes on in verse 7 and he says, you've gone away from my ordinances, my practices. You've gotten away from the things that you're supposed to do. And he says this, but if you return to me, I'll return to you. He says, in what way shall we return? 
Verse 8 says, will a, will, will a man rob God, but you've robbed me in which ways? Tithe and offerings. He says, you're cursed with a curse. And uh, he says, but if you bring all the tithes into the storehouse, he said, there will be food in my house. Try me in this, says the Lord. I'll open up the windows of heaven and pour out such a blessing that you won't have room enough to contain it. So that's our series passage that we've been teaching from. Last week, though, we started talking about offering. We started talking about offering. And it's important to understand that there is a difference between tithe and offering. There's a difference between tithe and offering. Tithe reveals my trust. Offering reveals my treasure. Tithe reveals my help me out. And offering reveals my? So tithe reveals my trust. Offering reveals my treasure. Look, now listen to this. Tithe is my responsibility. Offering is my opportunity. Tithe is my responsibility. What am I responsible for? To bring back what is God's. Offering is my opportunity. It's me out of the overflow of my heart, the affection of my heart. I'm going to come to God and I'm going to give unto him because I love him. It's a demonstration of my affection and love. It's an opportunity to love the Lord in this way. So tithe is my responsibility. Offering is is my opportunity. Tithe is fixed. Offering is flexed. Tithe is a tenth. It's a fixed amount. Offering, it's flexed. It's based upon what is in my heart. And so some weeks there might be something I want to offer to the Lord of a given amount or a given thing. But other weeks, God might have just been increasing me and blessing and doing so many amazing things in my life that there's another level that I want to honor the Lord with. And so your tithe is fixed, your offering is flexed. Again, tithe is my responsibility, offering is my opportunity. Tithe, listen to this now, I honor the Lord and I bring him my tithe, but with offering I draw near to God and I offer what is mine. So tithing, and we'll say this again, tithe, I honor the Lord in bringing him what is his, Tithe, I honor the Lord and I bring him what is his. Offering, I draw near and I offer what is mine. Now, the reality is this, everything belongs to God. So just know that. But he's saying, you do have this 90%. And it's up to you what you want to do with it. And I know this because I love God so much, I want to draw near to him. I want to offer him more. There's, reality is this, there really is no percentage at the end of the day that can really equate or, or, or demonstrate how much I truly love God. I want to I give him all of it because he is that good and he is that awesome and his promises and his principles are, I will give back to you, right? Uh, but as we're walking through this, understand that my tithe, I honor him by bringing what is his, offering, I'm drawing near and, and I, am, I, I am offering what is mine. We talked about last week that offering is two parts. It's drawing near to God and it's offering up a thing of value, something that's valuable. I don't want to come to God and, and just give him anything. I want to give him something that is valuable because your offering, your giving should always come from the heart, and I made this statement last week, if your heart's not in it, don't give it. If your heart's not in it, don't give it. Because if it means nothing to you, then it will mean nothing to God. But the something of value is not about the equal gift, it's about the sacrifice. So it's not about how much or what so-and-so to the left, to the right, behind you, in front of you did. It's about what has God placed in your heart. The Bible illustrates that there is a widow in the Bible that has two mites. And Jesus says she gave more out of the little that she had because it was everything than the religious leaders that had more than enough. And they were just going by just giving God a tip. So the offering, it is subject to what is in your heart, the principle of the offering is simply this, demonstrating my affection towards God, demonstrating my affection towards others. It's a two-part principle, demonstrating my affection towards God. Offering is also demonstrating my affection towards others. When we talk about demonstrating my affection towards God, Matthew 6.21 says, for where your treasure is, there your Help me out. For where your treasure is there, your heart will also be. 
where your treasure is is where your heart will also be. Jesus says, don't worry about, you know, saving up a whole bunch of stuff on this earth. It means nothing. Because at the end of the day, all that stuff is going to just waste away. Your heart should be with me. Now, I say that, but I also punch in a quick little caveat there. God's not saying not to have wealth. God's not saying not to have provision. God does not say don't have wealth, but what he's trying to point out is don't let wealth have you. Hear me on that? I mean, man, this is just the overview. <laughs> but I got to get you to this here because what we begin to understand is out of the heart, out of the affection of the heart is, 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 is where the offering flows. It's the demonstration of my affection towards God. David says in 1 Chronicles 29, is he says that, uh, uh, that uh, I've set my affection on the house of God. I've given to the house of my God out of my own special treasure. The Bible talks about how the fact that David gave nearly half a billion dollars to the, to the house of God. Exodus 25 says, those that have a willing heart give an offering of different precious metals and stones and, and different things that you can honor me with because when you do that, you're making me a sanctuary. And here's the promise of the offering. When you make me a sanctuary and you offer what's in your heart, I'll dwell among you. The promise, hear this, the promise of the offering is that God will dwell among you. So as I'm giving an offering, God will now, how does he dwell among me? Well, we understand that Corinthians says that all grace will be abound towards you. You will increase and grow in grace. How does God dwell among you? It's when I'm giving my offering that now God begins to give you grace and favor on the job, in the community, with your family, and everything that you put your hand to, you've got a favor that's upon your life to be able to be successful and prosperous and victorious in every area. That's the promise of offering. God says, I will dwell among you. And we talked about the fact that last week that, you know, we, we establish sanctuaries wherever we go because a sanctuary, it's, it's a place of provision and protection. And I gave the, the illustration last week when I go in to get something to eat, I have to offer up my money on an altar, which is called a counter, a checkout counter, in hopes that I'm going to receive something in return a lot of people last week came up to me and said, Pastor, what was that sandwich place you were talking about? <laughs> I'm so glad that was your takeaway. <laughs> but when I offer up and I lay my life on that, on that altar, it's establishing the place that I believe is going to feed me. It's going to protect me. So again, as we're talking about offering here, we're understanding that the principle is demonstrating affection towards God and affection towards others, but the promise of the offering is God says, I'll dwell among you and I will increase favor and grace upon your life. Anybody need some favor and grace in your life? Anybody want to walk into this week with the next level favor and grace? That all of a sudden that you've got breakthroughs that are taking place, that, that things are happening, that in the natural, you're like, I don't know how this, is gonna, how this is gonna work out, but God showed up. God began to dwell among you on the job. God began to dwell among you with that idea, that concept, that strategy. He began to give you wisdom beyond measure. I mean, that's what we're talking about here. That's what I'm looking for as I'm going into the week. Lord, I need you to dwell among me. I need you to dwell among me. So, when we look at this, we begin to see here that our offering, uh, it allows God to dwell among us. I, uh, I want to turn over to the book of Isaiah today. Let's turn over to the book of Isaiah this morning. Chapter 1. And I got to tell you something, right now, I accidentally opened up my notes, and I hit a delete button, so we're going to have to run straight from the hip today. <laughs> it's not in my trash. <laughs> I was like, hold on a second, I got so excited about God dwelling among us that all my notes just went bye-bye. I don't have the time to go back and look for it. So Jesus, 
anoint my heart over these next few moments. Grace and favor. (laughs) Thank you, Lord. Amen. Let's do this thing. Isaiah chapter 1. Um, what I want to see here, the Bible says, the Bible says this, if you're willing and obedient, you will eat from the good of the land. I want you to hear this. There we go. Verse 18. I want to start with this because When we're talking about offering, we're talking about demonstrating our affection towards God and our affection towards others. In demonstrating my affection towards God, the question we have to ask is, how do we demonstrate our affection towards God? And the way I demonstrate my affection towards God is my ability to be willing and obedient. Willing and obedient. Without willingness and obedience... I want you to read this and see this here. He says, without, without willing and obedience, you cannot eat the good of the land. But let me read, start in verse 18. He says this, come now, let us reason together. Somebody say, let us reason together. He says, come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. Verse 19, he says, but if you're willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But look at this. If you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. Isn't it interesting that that, that, that scripture right there says, if you rebel, you'll be devoured by the sword. The, the, the understanding behind that is this is that when you're not walking in obedience and according to the ways of the Lord, you put yourself in position where you don't have God's favor upon your life. The Bible says when you honor me with the tithe and you bring the tithe and the offering unto me, he doesn't only just promise that you'll have food in the house and the windows to be open, but he says, I will rebuke the devourer. I'll rebuke the devourer. The devourer simply, let's put it like this, is the taker. The taker. See, what this passage is saying is you'll be, if you're willing and obedient, you'll eat of the good of the land. However, if you rebel, you're going to be devoured by the sword. It didn't say that you're going to lose your sustenance, you're going to lose your provision. See, that's the trick of the enemy. The enemy knows this. He can get you prospering in your life, but if you're not willing and obedient, it'll just be taken away from you. That's what happened all the time in the book of Judges. The book of Judges, the people of God, man, they would start going on a winning streak. I mean, they were running and gunning and, 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 and slaying and, and, and success and everything, but then they started getting all filled up with themselves. The pride of life started kicking in. And the problem was, when they began to build up their success towards them, they got away from the things of God. And it was a matter of time until the enemy would come in and devour them by the sword. And so when we look at this here, to demonstrate our affection, we have to be both willing and obedient. It's two parts, willing and obedient. You can't just be willing. The word willing means to have a strong desire. Have you ever had this strong desire for something? Anybody ever have a strong desire for something? I had a strong desire on Friday when we decided to go get pizza. And this day was a good day because we went to a good pizza place. I shall not tell you the name. Some things are protected for me. And so while we were there recently, um, well, while, while we were there, we ordered our pizza. And um, my, my daughter recently has really gotten into soda. Now, we don't have soda in our house. We, we, we drink water. What do my kids get? They get water. My daughter believes that lemonade is water with lemon squeezed in it. If anybody of you messed that up for us, you're slipping her no minute maid now. (laughs) So we're out to eat, and um, she says, Dad, can I have some soda? Sure, we can do that. We're out, special, special moment, special treat. We're really big on the special treats in our house. It's a great way to get them to be willing and obedient. And so I told her, I said, I said, sit right here. I'm going to fill up the soda. 
wait for mom and brother to get back to the table, and then you can, then you can have it. And I could see her sitting on the chair, and those legs start going back and forth. She's getting really antsy. Dad, I could just help you maybe put some ice in it. Do you need some help getting ice in the cup? D- d- Dad, I, you, might, you, might need, you, you, you might need help holding the cup underneath the dispenser. She didn't say dispenser, but she's like, I can help, I can help get it into the cup. So she's trying to, I said, hey, I told you to sit right there and wait. Oh, she was so, she was so willing. Her desire was so strong. I said, but if you wait, if you're willing and you're obedient, you'll drink from the good of this cup. And so she's sitting there, she's waiting. Finally, I sit down and then I get distracted because our pizza came up and we're dishing everything out. And she was like, Dad, what about the soda? She's still sitting there. I was like, oh, I totally forgot about that. The point is this. It's not enough to be willing. God also says you got to be obedient. Obedience is my ability to respond accordingly to what I hear. Obedience is my ability to respond according to what I hear. So those who are willing and obedient, those that have a strong desire to hear and respond accordingly, will eat the good of the land. Hear me on this. Those who have a strong desire to hear and respond accordingly to God's word will eat the good of the land. The question is, though, what am I being willing and obedient to? So glad you asked. Psalms 112. Let's turn there really quick. It's funny, talking about special treats, man, um, for our kids. So my son does this thing now where we try to use that as motivation for him to eat his dinner. But whenever he hears something like special treat, he thinks he's going to get hooked up with ice cream, cookies, whatever. So he sits down and just pushes his dinner out of the way, and he's like, where's my special treat? You said it. It should be happening right now. In his mind, he thinks it's happening right now. And then when he doesn't get it, has anyone ever seen a three-year-old not get what they want? So what in the world came over this brother right now? I want to rebuke you and get you slain in the spirit for a second. I need some peace in this house. (laughs) Oh, it's fun being a parent. Look at this. I want to uh, look at Psalm 112. And he says this, starting in in verse 1. He says, praise the Lord, blesses the man who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in his commands. And his commandments. Bless the Lord, or praise the Lord, bless the man who fears the Lord, who delights greatly in his commandments. Verse 2. His descendants will be mighty on the earth. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches will be in his house. And righteousness endures forever. So if we take Isaiah 1 that says those who are willing and obedient will eat of the good of the land. What is the willing and obedience in accordance to? This right here. Blesses the man who fears the Lord and delights greatly in his commandments. So what do I want to be willing and obedient to? The fear of the Lord and delighting in the commandments of God. The fear of the Lord is my surrender and my trust in putting God first. Now, there's much more we could teach on that, but that's not what I want to focus on. But in in its simplicity, the fear of the Lord, it is coming before the Lord with an honor and a reverence and a trust and a surrender, saying that there will be no other God before me except for my God. And he says this, it's the, blesses the man who has the fear of the Lord, but here's what I want to see, who delights greatly in his commandments. My question is, do you delight in the commandments of God? The word delight is to, to take pleasure. To take, do you take pleasure in the word of God? Do you take pleasure in the word of God? Those who are willing, those who have a strong desire to hear and respond 
to the word of God and follow it with joy, with pleasure. That's what this passage is, is telling us when we put the two side by side. What is the outcome? In Isaiah, you're going to eat of the good of the land. In Psalms, he says this. Is he says that you'll be mighty on the earth. I love these promises. You'll be mighty on the earth. Your generation, the generation of the upright will be blessed. Wealth and riches will be in his house. And his righteousness will endure forever. So in other words, what God is saying is that you will prosper in your family, in your walk with the Lord, in your possessions. God wants to prosper you in every area of your life if you're simply willing and obedient to follow his commands with joy. And that's why he says in 2 Corinthians is that God loves a... Oh, you were with me this morning. God loves a cheerful giver. God loves a cheerful giver. God, God takes so much delight in you delighting in him. God delights in you prospering, but we should delight in our participating. We should delight in, in, in our ability to follow the principle of the offering because it's the demonstration of my affection towards God. Can we go a little bit further? So if we're understanding in demonstrating my affection towards God, I need to be willing and obedient. I need to delight myself in the Lord. In following his commandments, the question is, what are the commandments? we got to talk about what are the commandments. Well, let's take a look in the New Testament and see what the commandments are. Let's turn over to Mark, book of Mark, chapter 12. We're going we're gonna to jump in at verse 29. Mark 12, 29. So the Bible says this in Mark 12, 29. Jesus answered him and said, First of all the commandments, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one, and you shall love the Lord your God. Do you see that? Love the Lord your God. What's it say? Love the Lord your God. Here's what I want to look at. With all your heart, with all your, with all your mind, and with all your strength. With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Let's continue a little bit further. He says this. This is the first commandment. The first commandment. Verse 31, in the second, like it, is this. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. This is a great opportunity to say, hey, neighbor, I love you just like me. And Jesus says, there's no other commandment greater than these. So you understand he's putting these on equal playing field. To love the Lord with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and equally love your neighbor as yourself. What is the principle of the offering? Demonstrating my affection towards... Let's try that again. Demonstrating my affection towards... And towards... Okay, it's two-way. It's like the cross. The vertical beam, my affection towards God. The horizontal beam, my affection towards others. Jesus is on the cross. The thieves to the left and to the right. He looks at him and how does he demonstrate his affection towards the thief? Today you are with me in paradise. It's a good visual for you to remember the offering principle. It's my affection towards God, my affection towards others. But he says the way that you demonstrate your affection is by loving. Somebody say loving. How? With all my heart, my soul, my mind, my strength. Now listen, this is the path of the principle. I'm going to give you the path of the offering principle right now. And it is a progression. The offering principle starts in your heart. 
The heart is the very center, the core of who you are. The Bible says in Proverbs, it's out of the heart the issues of life flow. Not just the issues that require tissues, but the issues means it's a place of a stream that flows. You following me this morning? The issues that come out of your heart is not just, I got my problems. No, issues is anything that flows out of your heart. So the center point of my life is the heart. From there, it goes to the soul. The soul of a man, the soul of a woman is the lifeline. It's the life that's inside of you. It's when God formed man and woman or formed man in the dust of the ground before he pulled woman out of his side. But when he formed us, the man in the dust of the ground, he breathed life inside of him. When he breathed life inside of him, he gave him capacity. That life force is the soul. It's the drive. It's the place of willingness. But then he also says, heart, soul, now what? Mind. It's how I think. It's the processor. It's the thoughts. So I'm moving from loving God in my heart to the core of me to now in the very essence of my life to the way that I think I want to love the Lord in my thoughts. And then the last point is in strength, hands. Offering starts in the heart, but it's given from the hands. You following this? So I'm demonstrating my affection towards the Lord and loving him from my heart to my hands. If the heart's not in it, like I said, it makes no sense to do it. I want the heart to the hands. It is the path of the principle of offering. I love him with my heart, my soul, my mind, and my strength. This is how I demonstrate my affection towards God. But we have to also understand that I, Jesus said equally we have to demonstrate our affection towards others. Can we talk about others? Can we talk about us? I want to take you to this passage in the Bible. We're only going to flip back maybe one page for some of you. I want to jump over to Mark chapter 10. And this is really what I want to get into as, as our, our time right now for a few moments. Mark chapter 10, verse 17, is where the story begins here. And the Bible says this now, as he was going out on the road, one came running, knelt before him, and asked him, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Now, it's important that you note know what he's asking. What must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, why do you call me good? No one is good but one, that is God. You know the what? The commandments. Let's, let's, you, you know the what? The commandments. Now again, let's not forget what we're walking through today. Those who are willing and obedient, eat the good of the land. When you delight yourself in God's commandments, you'll be blessed and prosperous in every area of your life. Now here we are, verse 19. He says, you know the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Do not murder. Do not steal. Do not bear false witness. Do not defraud. Honor your father and mother. Verse 20, and he answered and said, teacher, all these things I've kept from my youth. In other words, he's saying, I have been practicing all of these things. You know what also was a part of that? Because it's not just the things that Jesus noted. It wasn't just honoring mother and father. It wasn't just not defrauding. It wasn't just, you know, not committing adultery. When he says all these things that he's been doing since its youth, it also incorporates all the ordinances, all the practices of every commandment in the Bible, which includes the offering principle, the offering practice. All these things I have been doing since I was young. Here's what the response, verse 21. Then Jesus looked at him, loved him, and said, but one thing you lack. Go your way, sell whatever you have, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Come, take up your cross, and follow me. He says there's one thing that you lack. You believe that you're demonstrating your affection towards God in the following the commandments. 
but one commandment I also give a secondary, which is equal. Love your neighbor as yourself. He says, you've been loving yourself (laughs) and not others. Here's the problem. You're demonstrating affection towards God, but you're not demonstrating affection towards others. And the result of it, in verse 22, says he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. Now, I want to just take one second and drop a spotlight on this. Here's an individual who has great wealth, great possessions, but he has a poverty mindset. He has a poverty mindset. He might have a lot of things in the natural, but his poverty mindset is, if I give it all away, I'll never get it back. A prosperity mindset is, I can give it all away, and I can get it all back. There's this interesting uh, story about Alexander the Great. And Alexander the Great, he is traveling uh, on the road with his army and and all of the other people that's important that's with him. And uh, as he's traveling down the road, he looks and he sees this beggar. And there's this beggar on the side of the road, has nothing and, and, and is in need. And so Alexander the Great grabs a couple of gold coins and gives it to the beggar. And one of the carriers that was with Alexander who would help carry his stuff, kind of like an armor bearer, turned to him and said, but Alexander, a few copper coins would have suited his need, would have been more than enough. And he said, a few copper coins would suit the need of the beggar, but gold coins suits the giving of the emperor. It's a term that's called royal generosity. Royal generosity, it's a term that if we can understand and apply it in the church, this is why in the book of Acts, there was no need. Because they understood what it was to give, to supply, and to minister to all the needs. And this is not talking about, well, I'm in need because I couldn't afford to buy a toothbrush. This is, hey, somebody said, listen, I'm in the mood for lobster tonight. Everybody got lobster. There was a need. Let's serve it. Let's fill it. Let's do it. That's how blessed and prosperous the early church was. There was no need. But we reduce it to this kind of like poor thinking, and it's not poor thinking. There's an elevated mindset in the kingdom of God, and we have to get out of, 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 of thinking that in how God wants us to demonstrate our affection towards others is just, I'm not here just to meet your need. There's two types of sowing, by the way. You sow into the kingdom and you sow for the kingdom. When I'm sowing for the kingdom, it means I am sowing from my heart into someone or something because I believe and I know that there is going to be a supernatural return. And so when we look at this, our affection towards others, the problem with the rich young ruler was his affection was on himself. Book of Acts chapter 11, you, I'm going to paraphrase this, but you can mark it down. There's a man by the name of Agabus, and he gives a prophetic word that says crisis is coming to the world. Crisis is coming. There's a big famine. And so what happens is, is Paul and Barnabas and a lot of the other, uh, you know, church leaders, they get together And the Bible says that each of them gave according to their own ability to the church in Judea. Now, isn't that interesting? If someone says, hey, guys, there's a famine that's coming to the world, what's the first thing that we naturally would do? First, we would probably deplete Costco. (laughs) Truth? Yeah, right? We'd build up our storehouses. (laughs) And then from there, we would probably try and figure out, you know, what, you know how, how do we need to, you know, steward our possessions and our finances and our money and all this stuff. But what they did, the first thing they did is out of their own ability, they sent relief to the church. They gave an offering to the church. Why? Because if you're willing and obedient to follow my commands, you'll eat the good of the land. They knew if we were to supply to the church, then we continue to put God in position, in place for him to release his power that there will still never be a need that's unmet. Hmm. 
So here we have in this story Mark, the rich young ruler. And this is where I want to, here's what I want to get us to. It's really just this one line. But we'll read a few more verses. Verse 23, then Jesus looked around and said to his disciples, how hard it is for those who have riches to enter the kingdom of God. And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answered again and said to them, children, how hard it is for those to trust riches to enter the kingdom of God. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. This is what I want you to see. It's easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they were greatly astonished, saying amongst themselves, who then can be saved? And I love it. Jesus comes back and he says this. He looked at them and he said, with men, it's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. Anybody believe that? With God, all things are possible? And Peter began to say to him, see, we left all and followed you. See, that's like some of us, like, Lord, we left all and we followed you. We are your humble servants and we don't need to have anything. That's not what Jesus is about to respond with. Look at this. Jesus says this. Surely I say to you, there is no one who has left house or brother or sister or father or mother or wife or children or lands for my sake in the gospel. Look at verse 30. Who shall not receive what? A hundredfold. When? Now. In this time, houses, brothers, sisters, mothers, children, lands with persecutions and in the age to come. What Jesus is drawing the attention to, and I already made the statement, is there's nothing wrong with wealth. Just don't let wealth have you demonstrate your affection towards God and your affection towards others, and here's what will happen. For the sake of the gospel, you will still have houses, lands, brothers, sisters, mothers. Some of you might want to edit a few of those family members out, but that's on you. But he says you'll have houses, lands, brothers, sisters, mothers, all these things now and in eternity. So the principle in when I'm offering to God are the affection of my heart and I'm offering and demonstrating my affection towards others means I'm going to be blessed in this life and I'm going to be blessed in the next life to come. Through and through. He says in this, one, in, in this time and the time to come. But, but, somebody say but. Somebody else said that a little bit too <laughs> firm. That was a pretty firm but. I want us to take a look at, go back to verse 25. Because what Jesus is illustrating in this principle, the explanation he gives, he comes to the rich young ruler, or he responds to the rich young ruler, take what you have, sell, give. But he went away sorrowful because he had many possessions. So Jesus responds, how hard it is, how hard it is for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And he gives this picture and he says, it's easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle. Isn't that an interesting illustration? What does a camel going through the eye of the needle have to do with a rich man getting into the kingdom of God? Let me explain. Camels, according to those days, were very valuable assets. Camels would have been like the Brinks to armored vehicle that we see on the roads today. Camels did not carry junk. Camels carried treasures. When they would load up a camel's back with possessions, it was always precious possessions. It was always things of great value. It was always things that were, were, were very, it represented wealth. As much as wealth could be re represented, there would be bags with gold and, and, and there would be, be bags with silver and, and all kinds of things. That's what camels carried. They were the asset, the, the Brinks armored vehicle that would bring it from A to Z. But when camels would arrive with its owner to a new kingdom, to a new city, 
what they would have to do is they would have to go through a small passageway, which is known as the eye of the needle. A better way of explaining is they had to go through a security checkpoint. That's what it was. And so the camel knew in order for it to get into that desired city, it would have to take off everything off of its back. All the wealth, all the riches, all the great possessions. And then it would have to humble itself by getting on its knees because this passageway was very, very small. And if you've ever seen a camel, whether it be on TV, in a picture, or, you know, live in front of you, they're, they're not small. They're tall. They're big. They're big animals. And they would have to humble themselves and get on their knees, and they would have to slowly inch their way on their knees through this passageway known as the eye of the needle. And what Jesus is saying, how much easier it is for a camel to surrender all of its wealth, all of its riches, all of its possession, humble itself, get low, and go through this tiny passway, the passageway. Jesus talks about the narrow gate, how hard it is to go down the narrow gate. Everybody's going on through the wide gate, but how hard it is to go through the narrow gate because the narrow gate, the eye of the needle, requires surrender. And surrender means I have to humble myself and I have to be willing to surrender everything that has been a treasure in my life because if I really prioritize my affection on God and my affection on others, then it's no longer about the things that I have. I'm willing to surrender it all because I know I'm putting God first. Here's the best part. When the camel gets through the wall onto the other side into the city, they take all the wealth, all the riches, all the possessions, and they put it back. Do you see the picture that Jesus is illustrating? He likens the humility of a camel as the entryway to the kingdom. I want you to get this. The camel carries the wealth, the possession, the riches. What are we called to carry? The wealth, the possession, the riches. The problem is, is that we don't see ourselves the way that Jesus sees us. See, Jesus sees us as camels that are carrying great possessions, great wealth, great riches, great honor. If you surrender to him, give to him, I'll give back to you, right? There's this principle that goes on here. But we see ourselves like donkeys. Donkeys don't carry gold. Donkeys don't carry wealth. Donkeys carry junk. And because we see our lives carrying, like a donkey, we're just going around carrying junk, and the Lord is saying, no, you're called to carry great wealth and treasures. See, the camel is an asset, and the donkey is just a... You think I'm joking with this. And we walk around being the butt and not the head. Donkeys carry junk, camels carry treasure. You're not called to carry junk, you're called to carry treasure, but the key to carrying treasure is demonstrating your affection to God and your affection towards others, which requires a life of surrender and humility. You hearing this? This is vital right now, because next week we're going to deal with a very, 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 very wonderful subject that we like to talk about in church, oh, conflict resolution. Because if you don't truly demonstrate affection towards others, you will not be blessed. And I've already made mention of this, but Malachi chapter 2 says that if you don't get it right with your brother or sister, if you're dealing with your family in the wrong way, you are not going to be blessed. In fact, in the New Testament, in the book of Timothy, it says that if you don't take care of your family, you're worse than an infidel. Don't come in here and give offering to God, but not make sure that you're taking care of your family. Don't think, oh, I'm divorced, it's not my responsibility. No, you've got children, you've got a responsibility, sir. I know that's forward, but I mean, hear me on this, because we want to come in and be, oh, I want God to dwell among me and bless God, and I'm going I'm to have all these things. Stop with the show. That's not what it's about. God is saying it's an act of surrender, demonstrating your affection to God, affection towards others. We'll talk about the others next week, but for the purpose of today, what I'm trying to get into your heart and into your mind is that 
God says when you surrender your heart before me, when you live your life to be a blessing towards others, you're going to walk in prosperity in this life and in the life to come. My principle has a promise, and my promise will always stand firm. Will always stand firm. Will always stand firm. I want to close this morning. You getting something out of this? I'm sure there's a lot more somewhere in here that we didn't talk about today. You know, uh, it's... (laughs) I think of all the years of being able to have the privilege to sit under the teaching and, and to hear this and to learn this. And, and, and I'll tell you, I'm just going to be you know, forthright with you. When we were coming into this teaching series on open windows, I said, Lord, I, I, I want to have a personal encounter with you and, and I want it to be revealed in, in, a, in a new convicting way for my life. Because there are things that I want to see in my life. There are breakthroughs that I want to see in your life. And it's got to be more than a practice. God, i got to have a foundation principle. God, I've seen you do it in my life. I can't tell you how many times just in, in, in what I'm sharing with you today. A couple years ago, uh, there was a family that was in need. And my wife and I, we turned to each other. And, and we were saving up probably for some trip, vacation or something. And, and uh, the Lord put it on our heart to be a blessing towards this family. And so we gave him $1,000. And it was less than two days. Somebody called me up and said, hey, uh, I need to talk with you. I was like, okay. When we set up an appointment, he said, no, I can come to your house. Ain't nobody coming to my house. He said, no, it'll be quick, in and out. He came to the house and he said, I was praying, the Lord spoke to me, and I want to give you $5,000. Yeah. I didn't, we didn't help the family in need because of that. We helped the family in need because our heart was, how can we demonstrate our affection towards others? How can we love and sow and honor and be a blessing toward God? How can you overflow? Because I so greatly desire to see you dwell among me, to dwell among the families of abundant life, to dwell amongst this place when we come together and worship. I desire so badly that when you step foot on the job tomorrow, that you see God in every thought and every decision and every word that you speak because you know you've laid your life down and surrender before him. You're willing to take it all off your back just like the camel was and get low and say, God, there's not one thing I can do without you. And so my life is an offering. And my offering goes beyond just what I say because it's also in what I do. I want to love you with my heart. I want to love you with my soul. I want to love you with my mind. I want to love you with my strength because I love you. And I set my affection on you, Lord. The rich young ruler didn't know how to set his affection. He thought he was doing all the things. But he missed the principle. And my prayer is, Lord, let us not miss the principle. It's not about just doing things. It's about the principle. It's the heart of the matter.